thank you very much, Tadeusz, and thank you to everyone um, who is attending today, and particularly thanks also to the National Library of Israel for hosting this series. Um, we hope during the course of the series to be able to give you uh, an introduction to the work that we're doing on the Newton Watermarks project, um, which is an international collaboration which began um, a little bit over a year ago. Um, but uh, today, uh, Stefan Litt and I will really be giving you an introduction to the Newton Archive and to some of the problems that the project um, faces and that it is hoped the project may help us in due course to solve. Um, and so as a way of doing that, I'm going to share my screen and talk you through some slides um, about um, Isaac Newton and uh, his archive. So um, Isaac Newton, I'm sure we all know, was born in 1642 and died in 1727. And he had an active career in a variety of fields um, from the early 1660s, really, um, until his death. Um, and over that period, he uh, wrote more and more and also preserved and collected more and more of what he wrote um, as an archive. Although at certain points during the course of his life, um, aspects of his archive were either lost or damaged, for example, by fire. Um, but we're looking at 60 plus years, 60, nearly 70 years of the productive life of an extremely productive individual. The easiest way to access um, a good deal of Newton's archive now is through digital technology, through the online presentation in particular uh, of the Newton papers uh, at the Cambridge Digital Library. Um, and this is a collaborative effort mounted by the University Library in Cambridge um, to present um, Newton's manuscripts alongside uh, transcriptions and editorial material and to present not just manuscripts from the university library but also from a variety of partner institutions some of which are partner institutions on this broader watermarks project for example um, the manuscripts held at king's college cambridge which will be mounted in the near future manuscripts held at the National Archives, which will also be mounted in the near future, um, and manuscripts held by the Royal Society, including the manuscript, the final manuscript of the Principia, Newton's most important scientific work published in 1687, um, which is already available on the Cambridge Digital Archive. Um, and as Stefan's presentation will show us, there is a corresponding uh, digital archive with similar collaborations with the Newton Project uh, at the National Library of Israel for its Newton materials. Well, I thought I'd show you using pictures from the Cambridge Digital Library and other sources something of the range of Newton's archive. Um, Newton's archive consists of um, a wide variety of manuscript materials, including notebooks, uh, which begin the very beginning of Newton's career as uh, an undergraduate at Cambridge in 1661, and which indeed reach back before then uh, into his uh, school days and his note taking and record keeping for his period of time at school in Grantham. They also include perhaps the most important of uh, Newton's notebooks, um, a collection of uh, a, a commonplace book kept originally by Newton's stepfather, um, which Newton converted into the waste book in which he recorded many of his earliest drafts of uh, important work, for example, work defining the nature of the calculus, um, which he later developed and which he later went back to also as evidence of his development of these theories once he was in controversy uh, over the priority in the priority dispute with Leibniz. So Newton's archive was for Newton as well as for us a working record and a place that he could go back to uh, in order to access uh, work that he'd done earlier in his career 
as well as um, his current interests and concerns. Um, it includes notes on his reading, including notes from uh, some of his earliest scientific reading on the left, his reading in the mid 1660s, uh, still as a student of Robert Hooke's Micrographia, published in 1665. Uh, it includes uh, experimental records and uh, the recording of uh, chemical and other laboratory experiments, for example, those from the early 1690s, uh, recorded here on the right hand side. Um, it includes uh, drafts of his most important uh, developments in the field of scientific instruments, above all the reflecting telescope, uh, which made his name initially and introduced him at first to the Royal Society of London in the early 1670s, uh, of which he became a fellow and then eventually 30 years later at the beginning of the 18th century president. Uh, it includes a wide variety of drafts of mathematical material, uh, including here the text of the De Quadratura, which Newton was working on in the 1690s, and which eventually he published alongside some of his work on optics uh, in uh, the optics that he printed in 1704. Um, and uh, it, in, it includes also includes correspondence by Newton. Uh, on uh, the left, a letter written by Newton himself, uh, a letter to um, that was uh, sent to John Collins, and that uh, forms part of a broader correspondence uh, for which we now have not only Newton's text but also some of Collins's copies in the archive in Cambridge. Uh, and just as Collins and Henry Oldenburg, the Secretary of the Royal Society, were some of Newton's most important correspondents of the 1670s, so Newton's most important collaborator of the 1690s, David Gregory, uh, and a whole host of other correspondents are represented in the archive. The archive isn't just confined to Newton's uh, private papers or to the development of Newton's thinking as um, a natural philosopher or as a private individual. Uh, it also includes public materials, materials, for example, about Newton's service uh, in the 18th century to the state on the board of longitude, assessing proposals to solve the longitude problem, or materials um, which have strayed from the larger archive now at the Public Record Office, the National Archives in Kew, um, which reflects Newton's work as a public servant, as a civil servant, uh, as a warden and later master of the mint. Um, and on the right hand side, there's one of very many uh, letters from that period to Newton, which slipped out with various forms of calculations, um, which look very much like many of the papers also to be found uh, in the Mint papers. They include, uh, the archive also includes work of Newton's written by people other than Newton. So not just pieces of paper that Newton wrote, but also pieces of paper that were written for Newton and that were kept within his archive. In this case, both pieces of paper written by the man who lived uh, with Newton in his rooms in Trinity, um, from the late 1660s to the early 1680s, uh, John Wickens, also a fellow of Trinity, and who drafted a great many of the most important uh, optical manuscripts that Newton composed in the 1670s, and also wrote correspondence for Newton, in this case, um, correspondence that Newton uh, would later come back to, to and refer to, for example, in his engagements with continental natural philosophers. It includes books, uh, including Newton's own uh, publications, such as his publication Principia 1687, or his The Optics of 1704, and its subsequent editions of both of these works, uh, with Newton's corrections and additions to them, and the editorial correspondence that accompanied such works. Um, for example, on the right-hand side, uh, the uh, correspondence from the um, Plumian professor in Cambridge, Roger Coates, uh, who edited the second edition of the Principia. And it also includes uh, work which is uh, copied for circulation 
amongst some of Newton's friends. Um, in this case, a copy of some of Newton's writing on uh, the calculus um, circulated in um, the environment of his follower, William Jones, who was an important figure in the interpretation of Newtonianism in the early 18th century, um, and probably written out by a man called James Wilson, who's later involved in the publishing after Newton's death of works which build on his findings uh, regarding the calculus. Um, so the archive is, uh, although it is mostly an archive of Newton's material, is an archive which also embraces both the writing and to some extent the thinking of a broader range of individuals involved uh, by the 18th century in the dissemination of Newtonianism. And the archive uh, records, therefore, uh, also something of the afterlife of Newton's ideas. Um, and that includes, therefore, the activities of the people who inherited Newton's archive immediately after his death. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, um, the husband of his half-niece, Catherine Barton, a man called John Conduit, um, who also inherited Newton's office as um, Master of the Mint. Conduit, who uh, immediately after Newton's death began writing or collecting material for a never published biography of Newton, some of which you can see on the right hand side, also um, selected from the archive things that would be published by him under Newton's name. And the most important of those texts, which begin to be published in 1728, the year after Newton died, uh, are bound up in this uh, extravagant fashion uh, within the archive in Cambridge. Not all of the archive, um, all of the archive was inspected by Conduit and his friends, but not all of it was found worthy to publish. Um, and a great many of the manuscripts in Cambridge, together with almost all the manuscripts uh, that can be found in Jerusalem from Newton's archive, um, have been assessed and by a man called Thomas Pellet, uh, who went through Newton's papers uh, in um, a few months after his death. Newton died in March 1727. In this case, you can see 25th of September 1727, and decided what was fit to be printed and what was not, and most was considered not fit to be printed, um, including important notebooks such as the one on the left-hand side, um, ex a good many extracts from which have since been thought worth printing by historians of science. Um, but Conduit and his friends uh, immediately began work uh, as you can see on the right hand side, on the editing of the manuscript that Newton had been working on when he died, a manuscript about historical chronology. Um, and they rapidly moved on uh, also to edit, uh, to create really, a text about uh, the interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation of St. John, uh, which they published in 1733 as Newton's observations. Um, on the prophecies. They also created a text um, which was uh, based on drafts and supplements that Newton had worked out to the Principia, um, particularly to the third book of the Principia, um, uh, on the system of the world, De Mundi Systemate, which they published. Um, and they worked extensively on the idea of collecting up materials that might be turned into a history of the church that they thought about publishing. And while the attempts to, uh, the, the manuscripts out of which these three of these books were printed exist in Cambridge, very many of the supporting materials and the materials that were sifted by the editors to create those manuscripts are distributed elsewhere in the archive, including very importantly uh, in Jerusalem, uh, large quantities of writings that uh, relate to what eventually became in the hands of Newton's editors, the observations on the prophecies. Um, and also in Jerusalem and in Geneva, uh, the manuscripts which were associated with John Conduit's efforts to create a text which he never published on church history by Newton. Um, 
again, using the Cambridge example and here uh, with the picture of uh, the man who took the lead in editing the chronology of 1728, um, Martin Folkes, one can see therefore um, in the archive, the hands of Newton's editors and of the people who are um, writing his books for him after his death. Um, and that's an Im important uh, aspect of the archive, as is the um, problem of um, uh, the way in which editorial interventions have reworked the archive and um, altered its form and changed its form and its format from the structure that it had when Newton died. Um, again, these pictures show some of the fruits of those editorial labours, the dedication to Queen Caroline of the uh, published chronology and some of the work of John Conduit um, in constructing uh, the contents that that book should have. Um, so that one can see the archive therefore acting as a source of collaborative work both during Newton's lifetime and after his death. Uh, collaboration both in the dissemination of his ideas and in the posthumous construction of those ideas for a much broader public. Um, and here one can compare uh, pieces of paper uh, which are located on the one hand in Cambridge and on the other hand in Geneva, left hand side in Cambridge, um, and which uh, relate to uh, again, to Newton's discussions uh, of the church and to the efforts of his editors uh, to put those manuscripts together. And I'm talking partly about the manuscript in Geneva because um, Mark Kolokowski, who is also here today, will in, later in this series uh, give a talk about the construction and history of that manuscript, drawing also not only on material in Cambridge as well as in Geneva, but also extensively on material which is now located in Jerusalem. John Conduit wasn't the only person who, uh, and his friends, John Conduit and his immediate circle of editors, were not the only people who had access to uh, Newton's papers after his death, although from the 17, mid 1730s, the interest in publishing work from Newton's archive declined, um, at least until about 40 years later when Samuel Horsley uh, was preparing uh, a new uh, edition of the collected works, the opera Omnia of Isaac Newton. Uh, and Horsley went back to Newton's archive and found there um, new texts, particularly correspondence, but also other materials, um, which he could bring into print and use to supplement uh, and to edit the published work of Newton, which he also reprinted in the late 1770s and early 1780s. And then in the 19th century, particularly after the publication of his initial brief life of Isaac Newton in 1831, um, the Scottish natural philosopher David Brewster uh, revisited the archive and really worked through the entirety of the archive for the first time in the preparation of his great biography of Newton, Memoirs of Isaac Newton, um, published in 1855. Um, so by the mid 19th century, the archive is known to scholars and known to people with an interest, both in the published work of, Ar of Isaac Newton, and also uh, with an interest in Newton's life, which by the mid 19th century, uh, the details of which by the mid 19th century are becoming more and more controversial. Um, and Brewster's biography, um, although it's partly supposed to uh, still controversy, for example, uh, controversy promoted by some French natural philosophers um, about uh, Newton's conduct as a scientist, um, also helps to keep running uh, and to generate further controversy uh, about aspects of Newton's personal behaviour and to some extent about aspects of Newton's uh, personal beliefs and practices. Um, and that's part of the background to the decision um, by, from uh, on the part of one of John Conduit's uh, 
eventual heirs, um, uh, because uh, Conduit's uh, estate and Newton's archive eventually published to eventually travel to the family of the Earls of Portsmouth. Uh, and uh, the uh, eventual inheritor, uh, fifth Earl of Portsmouth, Isaac Newton Wallop, um, decides in the 1860s that he uh, would like to approach the University of Cambridge uh, about uh, in order to make public or make publicly available the records of Newton's archive. And in 1872, Newton's papers go up to Cambridge where they're worked on by a syndicate of men, um, clockwise, uh, the professor of astronomy, uh, John Cooch Adams, the mathematician, George Gabriel Slo Stokes, um, the chemist, chemist and spectro spectro spectroptic, I'm going to give up on that. Um, the chemist G.D. Liveling and um, the university registry, H.R. Uh, Luard, um, worked through um, the uh, papers that had been sent up uh, by the Earl of Portsmouth and um, made a selection of what they considered the papers of scientific value, uh, which would be deposited thereafter uh, in uh, the University Library at Cambridge uh, and known as the Portsmouth Papers uh, or written uh, or belonging to Sir Isaac Newton. And it's from those selections made by this committee of scientists and university administrators that the bulk of the archive that can now be found in the Cambridge University Library derives. Um, there are some supplementary papers um, these include uh, papers that were already within the university archives, um, for example, uh, a grant to Newton as Lucasian professor uh, by Charles II, uh, King of England, or votes that were cast by um, professors in the University of Cambridge to elect Newton as the MP for the university at the end of the 1680s after the glorious revolution in England. Um, to sit in the convention parliament in 1689. Um, they also include uh, examples uh, of the uh, lectures that Newton had given as Lucasian professor that were deposited as an official record uh, in uh, the university archive uh, as Newton gave the lectures. So on the right hand side here, you have an example of such a deposit. And on the left hand side, you have an example of uh, a a, a, a draft of the same lectures um, that came to the university from Newton's own papers, his own retained papers, um, in eighteen in the in in the eighteen seventies, um, and uh, therefore the the archive in the university contains um, both the material that uh, was officially deposited there during Newton's lifetime and material uh, which came to the University Library uh, and was published, catalogue of which was published in 1888. And that represents the bulk of the material in Cambridge, although uh, there is also some uh, more, some associated material, including a good deal of correspondence, uh, which has been acquired by the Cambridge University Library, uh, in fact, in the last well, acquired almost 20 years ago, mainly, um, from other collections. Um, but it did not include the whole of Newton's archive. Indeed, uh, the uh, committee whose members I've taken you through uh, was quite restrained in its definition, or quite aggressive, depending on how you think about it, in its definition of what might constitute scientific material. And it sent back to the Earl of Portsmouth, as he had requested, um, the bulk of the material that uh, he had sent up to Cambridge that was personal in nature, or that uh, in the judgment of that committee had no scientific importance. And as a result of that, um, the family of the Earls of Portsmouth uh, retained a very large quantity of Newton material, of material deriving from Newton's archive um, into the 20th century. 
and the um, ninth Earl of Portsmouth, Gerald Vernon Wallop, as Viscount Lymington, as heir uh, to the uh, title, um, decided in 1936 to send those materials uh, to uh, Sotheby's in London, New Bond Street, for public sale. Um, Viscount Lymington is an interesting figure who um, has uh, links in the 1930s with extreme right-wing politics in England. Uh, he also has links with um, various ideas about uh, back to the land and the, uh, the importance of uh, sustainable farming. Um, he grew up on a horse farm in Wyoming um, and uh, was also engaged not only in a lot of political but also a lot of social activity in the 1930s. And it's likely that he sold the Newton papers primarily to pay for an expensive divorce, um, although he may also have used some money uh, to finance uh, some of his public and political uh, activities. Um, the a catalog was prepared and the manuscripts went on sale in July 1936. Now it's often said about this auction, which um, had several hundred lots and which uh, was attended by um, most of the London book trade at the time uh, and some important uh, foreign booksellers as well, um, that it wasn't a success and that it didn't raise very much money because it sold the whole of Newton's archive uh, for rather less than £10,000. Um, but in fact, if one compares the prices, which of course in 1936 were to some extent uh, affected by the Depression, uh, with prices being made by similar material at auction in the mid-1930s, um, Viscount Lymington did not do at all badly out of the sale of Newton papers. Um, and almost immediately, there was widespread competition um, amongst uh, important uh, English notables uh, who decided quickly that it was relevant to retain material from this archive uh, within the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, Lord Wakefield, for example, who uh, appears at the bottom right of your screen, um, bought immediately from the American dealer Gabriel Wells the largest lot at the auction, uh, which was the lot consisting of the entire, almost the entirety of Newton's work as master of the mint. And he presented uh, that lot uh, in its entirety to the then public record office, now National Archives, um, which therefore now holds all of the records of Newton's activities as a public servant. Um, by the second day of the sale, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who uh, you can see with some of his books in the middle picture on the screen, um, The Economist uh, and Fellow of King's College, Cambridge, um, had already formed a plan to buy uh, systematically alchemical material that uh, was being auctioned uh, from Newton's papers. Uh, and after the sale, Maynard Keynes uh, set about um, making up for lots that he had missed on the first day uh, and buying um, more material from the dealers who had purchased most of the material um, as Keynes formed the impression that this was of greater and greater importance and it was more important to have a coherent collection. Keynes had also bought other um, non-alchemical material and some of that he retained and some of it, as we'll see, he traded after the sale. Um, and he intended pretty clearly to deposit this material together with his uh, existing collection of books, uh, written and published by Newton. Um, he bought a copy of the Principia within uh, a few months before the sale took place, for example, um, at his college, King's College, Cambridge, and that is where uh, his uh, purchases now reside. Um, 
But others also bought at the sale, as I've suggested, most members of the London book trade um, from the, the top end of the book trade, uh, the book dealers, um, Mags and Quaritch, uh, down to smaller and um, less esteemed autograph dealers like Jacob Schwartz um, bought extensively, um, particularly some of the smaller lots at the sale. The man who, however, commanded the sale room is the man whose picture is at the top in the middle on this slide. Um, the Hungarian-American dealer, Gabriel Wells, um, a man who's, most of whose business was conducted by personal contact and private quotation, and who went away with all the largest and most expensive lots from the sale. After the sale, others bought from Wells, um, including uh, A.S. Yehuda, about whom we'll hear much more shortly, who's pictured on the right-hand side, and then eventually, uh, partly through the intervention of Yehuda and through Yehuda's own activities as a dealer, um, other collectors, such as Martin Bodmer, uh, in whose library in near Geneva, uh, the manuscript of the church now resides. So the 1936 sale um, had the effect of putting into the trade a very large number of Newton papers. And uh, as those papers were bought by institutions, so uh, Newton's archive has been distributed around the world. And one can see this in this slide from uh, the catalog of the archive in the Newton project. Uh, you can see that there are uh, items to be found at the National Archives in Kew to do with the Mint, the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library in Los Angeles, at King's College Cambridge, in Jerusalem, and indeed in literally dozens of uh, archives, uh, often holding only single or um, small numbers of pieces of paper uh, from the sale uh, across uh, North America, um, in Europe, uh, and uh, of course also importantly in Jerusalem. And there are also now Newton papers deriving from this sale uh, in Hong Kong and China and elsewhere. Subsequent sales of Newton material, for example, the sale devoted to important manuscripts of Isaac Newton at Sotheby's in New York in 2004, or the more recent Newton material, which has come onto the market in Paris as a result of the dissolution of the um, collection put together under the name of Aristophile. All of this material derives uh, in one way or another from the 1936 sale. Um, the Sotheby's sale in 2004 consisted of the purchases at the 1936 sale of the Parisian dealer, dealer um, Emmanuel Fabius, uh, whose um, holdings were liquidated by his family almost 70 years later. Um, and in recent years, uh, the availability of Newton manuscripts uh, in the market has uh, declined as uh, more and more of the uh, items offered for sale in 1936 have entered public institutions. But one feature of the distribution, the random distribution achieved by um, the sale in 1936 um, has been and the reordering of papers after the sale by dealers and collectors, uh, by buyers like Wells or collectors like Keynes and Yehuda, um, has been uh, the really very significant division of the archive and the division of the archive in a way which doesn't necessarily relate to its uh, physical state at the time that Newton died. And with that in mind, we've started to think recently about the physical materials that the archive is written on. That is um, the paper, all of it handmade paper, all of it paper, uh, which shows um, the evidence in its uh, structure of the molds that manufactured it, and hence also of the watermarks which those molds contained. And we want to supplement, therefore, the textual evidence that can be brought to bear to try and recreate um, the history of Newton's writing 
as it is now dispersed through the archive with material evidence um, that can begin to put back together uh, the order of writing and the form of writing um, that uh, of, of the various projects that of Newton's that are contained within the archive, and therefore to undo some of the effects of fragmentation and distribution, um, which uh, the 1936 sale in particular produced. And that's the purpose really of the Watermarks project. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Stefan Litt, who will tell you some more about the 1936 sale and its particular effects uh, on the library, on the collections that have found their way to Jerusalem. Yes, thank you very much, Scott, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, first, I'm uh, really delighted to see this well-known uh, handwriting of Newton on the screen now dealing with topics which usually usually are not represented in our collection since uh, our holdings do not focus on the scientific findings uh, Newton did during his lifetimes but more on uh, fields like uh, theology, chronology and um, ancient history in fact. So and I think also the um, the uh, options of modern technology, which help us now to present jointly in, a, in an event uh, bridging over thousands of kilometers um, all over the globe uh, is really thrilling and uh, uh, can just demonstrate to us um, how wonderfully we can work today. And it also brought up um, some ideas and thoughts about the fate of uh, personal archives. And now in our example from Isaac Newton, it's a comparatively early personal archive dispersed over uh, different places. And uh, at the end, it's actually still a miracle that these old and important papers uh, still exist in uh, public institutions and are now open for each and everyone. So um, let me now share some um, of the um, materials and processes that we know about, uh, which led eventually to the fact that the National Library of Israel uh, is one of the happy owners of a good share of Newton papers. And uh, I still remember when I first made contact with this institution um, far more than a decade ago, I was really wondering how, how, what happened here? How can it be that uh, Newton's papers ended up in Jerusalem? And there's a, um, maybe not a very easy, but there's of course an explanation for that. So um, again, uh, let's remind uh, how Isaac Newton um, most likely looked like, maybe not in everyday life, but um, in a very representative style for this uh, copper plate on the left-hand side. And the gentleman who is responsible for this um, yeah, um, um, acquisition of Newton's papers in 1936, and he was already mentioned before by Scott as uh, Abraham Shalom Yehuda on the right-hand side, who was um, a, an Orientalist and also a dealer of uh, old manuscripts and uh, archival items. He was Jerusalem born um, by a um, Jewish uh, father coming from Baghdad, from Iraq, and a German Jewish mother. He was raised in Jerusalem in different languages, and um, he did his most of his academic studies in Germany, held an academic position in Madrid later on, uh, during which he was uh, photographed on this impressive um, um, print. And he was also um, spending more than two decades almost exclusively in dealing with manuscripts and exchanging manuscript, manuscripts with uh, very prominent libraries like um, the private library and collection of Chester Beatty and uh, Princeton Library and other places all over the globe. So um, he, as we know, was not attending personally the uh, mentioned auction in Sotheby's in 1936, but he was well informed about it. And he had several copies of this catalog that we already 
saw in uh, Scott's presentation. And you can see here on the on the outside cover of this uh, catalog the uh, numbers of loads that Yahuda uh, eventually could put his hands on, and um, also he marked on the on the uh, folios of the same catalog <clears throat> who were the other uh, dealers and uh, persons who acquired some of the loads. And uh, this was uh, something very important for him because as um, John Maynard Keynes did, also Yehuda was interested in uh, bringing some of the materials together in the field um, I mentioned as um, theology, ancient uh, history and chron chronology. And um, basically I think, and also other scholars have made some uh, um, um yeah thoughts about it why he did uh, show this interest in these fields and i think it may have been related to the fact that he was of jewish descent and that he was born in jerusalem and jerusalem uh, for those of you who know the um, theoretical writings and theology of uh, isaac newton uh, does play a good uh, role and prominent role in his considerations about um, the end of the days and um, this is definitely something that fascinated Yehuda. So uh, in our files, um, maybe I should also mention that um, after Yehuda passed away in 1951, uh, his widow actually promised to the National Library to donate all of his um, collections and his personal papers to that very institution. Um, she unfortunately passed away during the process of preparing all these items um, to be donated to the uh, National Library in, in Jerusalem. And uh, there was no clear written will on, from her side. So um, there was a, a law case in, going on in, in Connecticut in the US about the uh, ownership of this collection and his papers. Um, eventually, in 1967, it's been decided that um, the papers should indeed um, uh, be transferred to Jerusalem. And um, a year later on, we received this incredibly rich and, uh, and huge collection covering um, Islamic manuscripts, Jewish manuscripts, Christian manuscripts, his own papers, which are endless and very interesting as you see that he was corresponding with most prominent figures of his time and uh, also of course the collection of the uh, Newton papers and other important sub collections and this um, slide brings us back to the talk of Scott uh, since he mentioned several times Gabriel Wells who was one of the dealers being um, actively involved in this um, auction at Sotheby's in 36. And you see that um, Wells was informing Yehuda in this letter on the left hand side about the loads that um, Keynes um, had acquired before. And uh, Yehuda was uh, interested in a number of those. So you see that in the middle, you see that Yehuda held those lists, not just um, concerning Keynes, but also other persons. Um, and about the the loads they acquired and uh, what's what's um, their size. And um, at the end, there's also a personal correspondence between Yehuda and Keynes. And there's just one example on the right hand side, a letter um, which uh, clearly indicates that um, they are um, separating their fields of interest since Yehuda was interested in uh, theology, chronology, and ancient history. And uh, at the bottom of this letter, you see that um, Keynes is considering to focus his interest more in alchemical papers. And at the end, we know that they did some uh, exchanges between them, as Yehuda did also with other personas of his time. Um, other examples concern uh, holders uh, of different loads like uh, Edwards or again Wells. You see also the Hebrew remarks on the um, left border of the of the sheet um, where Yehuda pointed out whether he was successful in acquiring them or not. 
Another major player was uh, Max Brothers, the company being active in this um, uh, auction and also then um, informed Yehuda about other owners and about their ability to supply certain uh, manuscripts um, offered during the auction. We also have clear indication that Yehuda was um, um, intrigued by this whole bunch of papers for a couple of years, as you see on his personal note sheets, uh, where he was uh, pointing out um, um, the load numbers that he was uh, successfully um, uh, buying elsewhere and uh, right in the middle, oh no, it's actually on the, in the middle of the uh, right part of this sheet, you see he is uh, writing in Hebrew um, that he is um, he was buying a part of uh, Newton's um, genealogy. And uh, this is this very piece that we have uh, as part of our holdings, um, tracing back you know, Newton's family history for a couple of generations. And um, we also know that Yehuda was working on the contents of the of the material he acquired and prepared several articles about these uh, until then unknown, almost unknown uh, papers by Newton. But not just that, he was also offering apparently a good share to uh, famous institutions he was uh, in contact with before, he had been in contact with before, like um, the uh, um, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University in the US. And in this letter from 1940, they are regretting for not being able to um, accept his offer to buy a good share of the Newton papers. And uh, this is due to the very um, common um, considerations of libraries until today, whether to uh, invest a lot of money in special items which are of interest for a very small group of researchers or whether it's better to put the same money on um, more recent publications which, which could serve a broader audience, of course. So um, some examples, some more examples of the Newton papers you are fam you have, um, um, uh, already, um, you got some impressions about his handwritings from the examples Scott had shown before. And uh, you see on the, uh, on the left hand side, there's um, one sheet of, out of a, a treatise dealing with the uh, measures of the uh, temple in Jerusalem, the ancient Jewish temple in Jerusalem, even including a small uh, drawing about um, the um, dimensions of the temple, which intrigued him for a couple of years and it's, um, it finds its um, um, proofs in a number of texts. And on the right-hand side, you see um, the beginning of a chapter of the chronology of the first ages of the Greeks and Latins. So um, what we did with those papers after being arranged in our collection that uh, was, for example, um, a good um, exhibition realized in uh, 2007. Uh, for which we also produced this bilingual catalog in English and Hebrew about uh, Newton's papers in the National Library's holdings. Um, most recently, we um, redesigned our uh, website of the National Library and created also a number of um, gateway pages for different topics and uh, contents. And one of them, of course, is um, our bunch of the Newton manuscripts uh, explaining to our users uh, what they are about. And later, or, um, if you scroll down, you are able to see a number of uh, selected items from the collection in uh, digital copies, which are available, of course, uh, also through our website, but also um, involved in this um, joint project that uh, Scott had mentioned before, um, the Newton project, where, of course, our texts are included as well. So thank you very much for your patience. And I'm uh, going back and uh, giving my stage back to Tadeusz. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. We have a few questions. Um, Scott, actually, they were addressed to you. 
so um, have you received them? The one which I sent you. Meanwhile, I just wanted to say that uh, actually I forgot to mention one important person who is also here with us online. This is uh, Mark Kowakowski, uh, who was um, who also uh, took part and initiated actually this collaboration between us, the National Library and the Cambridge University. So thank you very much, Mark, um, for uh, your work as well. And now, Scott, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Mark, by the way, Mark is originally from the University of Geneva, but as I understand now, he is a fellow at the Cambridge as well. So Mark will have um, his presentation in March, but we'll inform you about this. Thank um, you. Uh, Scott, um, can I you? Can, I can see several questions, yes. Um, I can see um, uh, a, a question which asks, um, are there any pure manuscripts of Newton scientific yes. material? Um, to which the answer is that there are um, thousands of pages of um, Newton's uh, scientific activity of all kinds, um, as I I think showed you some examples of uh, from his earliest scientific notebooks. So notebooks which show him, which begin actually with working through, as it were, his scientific education in Cambridge, uh, through the drafts of um, the invention of his own ideas in the 1660s, his first telescopic observations, uh, his first astronomical calculations, his first work, or his de development of his mathematical education, particularly his study of um, work on studying um, curved lines and areas under them. Um, very extensive work uh, in mathematics, in optics, um, drafts of his first lectures and his subsequent lectures, uh, as Lucasian Professor of Mathematics. Um, the whole of his um, scientific output um, through correspondence with the Royal Society, uh, through the drafts of his published works, through correspondence with a whole range of natural philosophers um, across the world, mainly in England and Europe, but one or two in North America, um, uh, about uh, his scientific work, about scientific observation, um, moving in, as I said, and later in his career to sort of a public role uh, as um, a scientific official in some ways. Um, all of this is represented in the archive in great detail. Um, most of it, because of the sorts of decisions made by um, the committee that I introduced you to working in Cambridge, most of it is now found in Cambridge. Um, and the main exception to the material in the university library in Cambridge is Newton's work on uh, chemistry or alchemy, um, which was puzzling to people in the 1870s. Uh, and which is perhaps less puzzling now, now that we have more accurate histories of alchemy. Um, and that was the material that Keynes particularly wanted to collect, but which uh, aspects of which are found uh, in the materials in Cambridge University Library and also in materials distributed all the way around the world. Um, and then um, there is another question I see, um, which is, um, how was Albert Einstein able to review Newton's scientific material? Did he buy the manuscripts? And the answer to that is, um, well, I mean, Einstein was able to um, read, of course, Newton's published scientific work, his um, the Principia and um, the Optics and other work. And indeed, he, he was involved uh, in writing a, um, a foreword to a reprint of the optics in the early 20th century. Um, but Einstein was also, uh, Einstein didn't see Newton's manuscripts, but he did correspond with Yehuda about Newton's manuscripts. And both Yehuda and Yehuda's wife actually write to Einstein um, about uh, the Newton manuscripts and about uh, 
what what might become of them. And I don't know if Stefan wants to add anything as um, the keeper, not only of Newton's papers, but also of Einstein's archive in the National Library that is in Jerusalem. Stefan, do you want to add anything? Yes. Um, thank you, Scott. And uh, first, I have to mention that the Einstein archives are not longer part of our holdings um, because um, more than a decade ago, our institution separated from the Hebrew University. So we are now two separate institutions and the Hebrew University as the rightful owner of Einstein papers um, demanded them for their uh, custody. So they are not longer kept in, in our collections and uh, we do not have direct access to them, although they are in a, a neighbored building uh, closely to us. So um, most of their papers are also available online and it's easy to check uh, what um, uh, the correspondence between Einstein and Yehuda and Yehuda's wife about that topic was. Um, we could find some um, letters um, exchanged between Einstein and uh, Ethel Yehuda, Yehuda's wife, who was uh, apparently um, strongly involved in her, her husband's activities, not just on that topic, but in general. Um, I see another question which is related um, to the uh, chronological history. To the best of my knowledge, and Scott, you may uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not such a good uh, expert on, on Newton as you are. I think that uh, Newton was not so much focused on um, uh, matches of uh, history um, and, and the appearance of Jesus Christ in general, because I think he had his own theological theory about how uh, religion should be practiced, which was... Uh, not something he could express freely during his lifetime. And uh, I think there are some uh, more recent books uh, dealing with his uh, theological writings and there might um, be a good answer to that, but maybe you can help in this regard. Um, well, the, the question asks whether Newton's uh, chronology uh, concerns itself with the calculation of dates of Christ's return and whether or not Newton's interpretation of the prophecy um, coincides with historical dates um, that we know today. Um, and um, I mean, a great deal of the material in Jerusalem and also some of the material elsewhere um, relates to <coughs> Newton's concern to try to trace um, historically the fulfillment of prophecy in both prophecy from the Old Testament, particularly from the book of Daniel, and prophecy from the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation. And Newton thought that those two prophecies, prophecies of Daniel and prophecies of Revelation, um, could be um, synchronized, could be tied together along a timeline to produce a single prophetic history, um, both of what was for him well, what was for the prophets the future, but by Newton's time was partly the past and partly the future. Um, so um, uh, the question then becomes one of how does one um, tie fulfillment with events? And Newton does indeed concern himself with a great many events that are that he dates as well as he can, and sometimes we would agree entirely with his dating of events um, in um, classical history and um, post-Christian classical history in um, the history of the Middle Ages and indeed um, even up to the times of the Reformation. Um, and uh, he associates those with um, stages in the uh, language of the prophets, which he also analyzes comparatively. Um, and he does indeed, in some cases, make future predictions, particularly about the sorts of length of time that uh, prophecy relates to. So he doesn't make specific predictions for events that will correspond in the future to the fulfillment of, of unfulfilled prophetic um, imagery, 
Um, but he does think about the total length of time that uh, prophecy will take to be fulfilled. Um, he's not sure about the answer to that question. Um, you can find a suggestion that uh, prophetic time may begin to come to an end in the 1840s in Newton's writing. And you can find suggestions that prophetic time will continue at least until 2300 in Newton's writings. Um, of course, the end of prophetic time isn't necessarily either the end of um, history, because there is then the question of what happens to the world after the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, and that's something that Newton also speculated about, but um, he didn't uh, necessarily put specific time periods on that. So I hope, hope that goes some way anyway to answering um, that question. answer i think uh, i see uh, one hand uh, raised this is barbara berry so uh, i will unmute you barbara and uh, please ask your question by microphone okay. I, guess you could... I had a question about um newton's alchemical writing and not only where it is but how important it is in the overall archive um, well, um, Newton's, um, the, the most important collection of Newton's alchemical papers is in King's College, Cambridge, and is the material collected by Keynes. But that partly depends on what you define as mo most important, because you could actually say that um, the chemical notebook that Newton kept, which is... Um, it involves a lot of alchemical experiments, which is in the university library, is, is his most important alchemical, surviving alchemical text. And you could also say that um, notes of his alchemical reading and of the books that he thought were most important for an alchemist to read, um, which are now mostly in uh, a variety of libraries in uh, New Haven, um, those are also uh, very important for understanding what Newton was trying to do in alchemical terms. Um, now, as to the question of what was the importance of Newton's alchemy, um, well, um, Newton spent, um, and Bill Newman, who will talk on uh, the 15th of January, will take, you through, take us through some of uh, Newton's alchemical work, probably with some examples, um, based in fact on a manuscript which is in Jerusalem. Um, Newton was uh, in, engaged in a long-term investigation of the properties of various um, metallic compounds. Uh, he was interested in that for a wide variety of reasons, including at times for the making of mirrors for telescopes and things like that, at other times for constructing um, uh, ingredients, building ingredients for medicinal compounds. Um, and he pursued a wide range of the main interests of contemporary alchemical literature based on a wide reading and um, decoding into real experiments of that literature. Um, and he spent a lot of time on it. Okay, hey, um, we have uh, another question and let it be the last question. Um, Scott, do you see it? Another question from Leslie. Did Newton consult with optometrists and neuroscientists about optics? Um, well, they weren't, they weren't really, um, I mean, in a sense, there weren't really either of those sorts of people around in Newton's lifetime, though in a sense also the answer is yes, in the sense that Newton did work with spectacle makers or members of the spectacle makers company and other optical practitioners to um, grind lenses and develop mirrors for his optical research. And it's also the case that um, Newton's ideas about uh, the optics um, were included in um, a work by an English um, uh, 
researcher into the nature of the eye and vision, who was also interested in the neurology of vision, building on the work of Thomas Willis, a man called William Briggs, um, whose work published in the 1690s is very much conducted within a, a, a Newtonian framework of optics. So although those are possibly slightly anachronistic terms for describing people with whom Newton worked, the areas of interest and skill that optometrists or neuroscientists would have were areas of interest and skill um, that uh, Newton was concerned to access and to collaborate with. Dear Scott, dear Stefan, thank you very much for your wonderful presentations and introducing us to the great world of manuscripts of Newton. Thank you, uh, all of you, for coming and attending, and see you next month. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.